Hi, this is Martin Ruhr, ASC, and you're listening to the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben, it is time for another action-packed, fun-filled adventure on Cinepod, the cinematography podcast. That's pretty sweet. I'm very excited. Hey, who's on the show today? It is Martin Rua, cinematographer of... Oh, my brain Tender only bar. gave me... Her, ten, my brain literally said the Hurt Locker, and I'm like, no, no, it's not the Hurt Locker. It's the Tender Bar, cinematographer of the Tender Bar. Yes, and I had a great conversation with him, and we'll get to it in just a few minutes. But instead of close focus, because we do close focus every time, I think it's time that we answer some of our long neglected listener mail we, it's yeah. been so long <laughs> it's it's a cinematography podcast mailbag hey and before we get into that we should also mention how close to a million downloads has the cinematography podcast had in its what seven year history how close are we to that million uh we're frightfully close we're at nine hundred and eighty-seven thousand and change so really about thirteen thousand. so we will hit it very very soon Ooh, but if you if you'd exciting. like to try to hurry up and make it happen in february Download one of our back catalog episodes you haven't heard before. You know, I, I'm going to just throw out that Bradford Young is excellent. If you've not oh heard that one, you should go listen to that. Or Wally, Wally Fister. Fister. Wally Fister has three episodes there. Ellen Try Curis. I, yeah. I can't tell. I always tell people when they've never listened to it before, start with Ellen Curis. All of those are fantastic. Or maybe try one of our war story episodes, which let me tell you, get plenty of love and plenty of shares. But, you know, uh, friggin Russell Carpenter shot Titanic. Come on. Give the guy a listen. He's brilliant. Yeah, or a war story. There, there's a whole bunch to choose from. And also, you know, another milestone, we had a record month of 42,000 downloads in January. Whoa. So we are, my understanding is now we're in the top 2% of all podcasts in the world. So that, that's awesome. We're, we're rocketing up there. Now, it's a pretty big jump to get to the top 1%, but at 42,000 downloads a month, we're, we're in solidly in the top two. So it's like, look out, Mark Marin, we're coming for you. <laughs> no, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, so Ben, we got a bunch of neglected uh, listener mail that we need to get to. Uh, who's written to us lately? I want to start with somebody who has uh, one of the most fun names I've ever heard to pronounce. You ready? It's Josh Clutterbuck. Yeah, Josh. Yeah, Ooh, Josh uh, wrote to us before and you actually did a nice long reply earlier and he gave us an update. I guess he took some advice or maybe he didn't. I don't know. Well, <laughs> here, I'll, I'll read the letter he sent us. Hey guys, just wanted to reach out again. It's been a year since I last messaged you, and I couldn't thank you enough for the time you put into discussing my situation. Your podcast is still a highlight. After much consideration, I changed my mind about four times before realizing life is too short and I needed the change. So here I am, recovering from COVID. Ugh, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> dude. Oof, I know that feeling. Recovering from COVID and a fortnight out of having quit my job of 12 years and a month away from starting film school. Congratulations, Josh. Wow. Something that stuck in my head was not having to make your passion your nine to five, which really made me consider I should make time for that passion. But the way things were, it was never going to happen. I was starving myself creatively, and I needed the change to allow time to explore the options possible. Again, this podcast has been so important for me to remind me of all the wonderful things film and screen provide in people's lives. Though I know there is a lot of hard work ahead and unpaid hours... Yes. One or two. <laughs> but why be stuck working for an organization you hate just to be comfortable? Thanks again, guys. Wow. Yes. Wow. So Josh was, I, I remember talking to Josh on uh, Facebook some time ago, and yeah, he was he was kind of weighing whether or not to go to film school, whether to stick with the more dependable uh, survival job. And uh, I look forward to any and all updates from Josh about how that's all working out for him. Yeah, I do too. That's awesome. Thanks very much for the for the letter, Josh. I appreciate it. Yeah. And, and, you know, it really means the world to us uh, because we basically do this for free. It means the world to us that we're providing any inspiration for you. You know, we, we love talking to the people who we talk to and finding out the information that we're finding. But the fact that it's valuable to you really, you know, makes it all worthwhile. So thanks so much, Josh. All right. You have another email or letter you want to get into there? I do have another email. And this one is a little bit more of a criticism of something we ooh, said ooh, uh, ooh, regar okay, regarding yeah, Spotify. I, we can take the criticism. Bring it on. Man, yeah, I don't know. This is from 
M H E N A G H A N, Mahanagan. I'm not sure. Hey guys, I've been a longtime listener and just catching up to the Station Eleven episode, and I wanted to reach out about Spotify. Your criticism saying Spotify is overvalued and should pay their artists more is unfounded. Spotify doesn't pay artists directly. They create a contract with the record labels who then decide how each artist under that label gets paid out percentage-wise. They also give the independent artists a chance to be discovered and make money on their music when they would have otherwise never been discovered. Okay, I have to uh, fess up to my general ignorance about the way the music industry works here. I will say this. Uh, Spotify is paying Joe Rogan a reported uh, $100 million for his contract. And it's like a small percentage of a penny per play for established artists. And it doesn't take much of a web search to find that Spotify, which is the largest of the music platforms, actually pays out the least. Now, I, I understand that labels definitely are middlemen in this process. I don't know exactly how they come to the percentages, and I won't pretend to uh, to know that. Uh, I guess my point was I'd rather that the Joe Rogan podcast money was going more towards artists and for independent and unknown artists, the amount of money that they make on services like Spotify is so insignificant as to be useless. And uh, I think most of them are on there for the reasons that we're stating, you know, about getting exposure and stuff. But it really is like trying to get exposure as a filmmaker by posting a video on YouTube. Like it's it's not going to get you a lot of exposure. It's not going to really move the needle for you. You have to be there in case you know, your, your stuff starts to take off and, you know, after a million plays, you'll make 50 cents or whatever, whatever the percentage works out I, to. I can tell you exactly what it is. Spotify pays four thousandth of a cent. So it takes about after a million streams, they get paid around 3000 to 3,500 bucks. That's about what it is. So yeah, it yeah. takes a million well, I mean, streams. Four thousandth. So after 4,000 streams, they get a uh, one penny. That's correct. That's yeah. correct. One penny. So, um, and, and interesting, yeah, that, that, you know, Apple music pays almost double at 7.8 thousandths of, of a cent. And uh. there's a, there's a service called Tidal, which pays the most, which actually pays 12 hundredths of a, a cent, which comparatively to compared to all the others is, is actually quite a bit of money. So, well, and, and feel free, honestly, to set us straight because, you know, like, let's say you're on. Uh, just to name a, a label at random, you're on Electra. I don't know if Electra has a deal with Spotify that they get X number for all the streams and then they decide to disseminate that money to their artists however the way they see fit. That's on Electra. But I do think that my big point then was that Spotify was able to lose, I believe it was $4 billion in value or something in a day. And we were all like, meh. Yeah, they'll be fine. You know, the fact that we feel that way about them to me means they could be paying all artists, not just independent artists, not just anyone. You know, it doesn't matter. Beatles, Paul McCartney, whatever. Everybody could be getting paid a lot more because that's the backbone of Spotify instead of taking all the work of those artists and funneling that money to to a Joe Rogan. I'm not necessarily shaking my finger at Joe Rogan in, in particular, although I don't listen to his podcast and anyone who uh, tells people not to get vaccinated is someone who I'm probably going to avoid. And, and actually, one of my favorite science podcasts, Science Versus, was about to move to Spotify and they have indefinitely postponed that move and they're a gimlet podcast so that was you know kind of a a big deal so anyway i'm not saying i was right about that and i hope that you find that satisfactory but please feel free to reach out to us again and set us super straight we'll we'll put you back on that that's totally fair all right so um i want to do some reviews like i haven't been to the apple podcast reviews section in a while and I'm pleased to see that we have a 5.0 rating, which is awesome. Yay. And we've got like 94 ratings now, which is really great. But and because it's been such a long time ago, it's been a a, a year ago. This this review came in. I'm going to start with here from Sonic Lava. Sonic Lava. Hey, thank you so much for for the the love that you shared here. The headline they wrote on the review is the authority on cinematography, and they wrote five stars. I am a current film student and love this podcast. It has given me more direction in the path I want to take in film, and I've learned so much from you guys. I'd love to see you interview Todd Campbell on his work with Sam Esmail. Thanks, guys. So would we. We would, we'd really love to do I'm that. I'm down. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to task uh, our producer, Alana Cody, and see if we can make something happen. That'd be great. 
Uh, okay, moving on. Actually, this is someone I've met. Someone is a customer of Hot Rod Cameras, uh, Pedro Gumerez, SOC. He wrote the best cinematography podcast. That's that's extremely kind. Been binging for months now. Just keeps getting better. Love all the segments and opinions. Keep it up, guys. It's great. Thanks so let, much, Pedro. Let no one say that we're not opinionated. <laughs> that's true. Uh, I like the headline of this one, which is The Bee's Knees from Whoa. West Nap. So uh, it says a great companion to the experience of working as an AC or cam op or a seasoned DP on set. You mostly get to observe their physical approach to the craft with possibility of a little insight into their thought process. This podcast is great because it gives you the other side of that coin, emphasizing the decision making and the problem solving that are just as important, if not more important than the physical execution of the craft itself. Thank you, Wes. That's a fantastic uh, review. I really appreciate it. And then I'll do one more here. There's there's a lot, and I'm going to skip over some of them, but the, the, this last one I'm going to do here is from, it looks like Camilla Almond. So th- thank you, Camilla Almond. They write, A-plus info, as a young aspiring filmmaker, cringe in parentheses. No, uh, this don't is, cringe. We were all there. Come on. <laughs> every one of us was once a young every aspiring Every one of us. <laughs> everyone who was ever on this show was... Was pretty was much just a, yeah. a an aspiring dope at one point, like you know, just babe in the woods, no idea with what they were doing. Well, Camilla continues. This is such a useful podcast, full of wonderful information, insights, and personality. The hosts are great at asking questions. Thank you. That mm-hmm. elicit useful answers for the listeners. And I always finish a listen feeling inspired and motivated to keep grinding and making something of my own. Whoa. I am applauding right now, Camilla. Thank you so much for that. Because, yeah. uh, you know, if we can be inspiring to people, if we can help people try to push forward, then I think we're really accomplishing something. I'm really, I'm really very, very proud of that. I mean, that's what we tell literally everyone who comes on the show. It's part of kind of our now very boilerplate spiel, which is that we're here to inspire people. We want people to hear, you know, diverse, interesting backgrounds and stories about how people broke into it. And, you know, please take as long as you want to explain yourself. And, and I feel like that's, that's why, you know, we, you never know who is the younger version of you who's sitting at home wondering, can I do this? And when you, when they hear your voice, when they hear you explain, you know, how you got there, it, it's inspiring to, you just, you never know who, who's going to be inspired, who's going to pick it up and run with it. And so to me, it's, that's honestly what keeps me really engaged with this. All right. Well, I think that's a perfect way to transition into our interview with Martin Rua. All right. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Martin Rua, thank you so much for being on the Cinematography Podcast. Thank you for having me. I want to dive into your new project, and it's another collaboration with George Clooney. I know you, you've you worked with him several times before. Why don't you, you know, I could do the whole introduction, but uh, I'd like to hear how you would describe it. How, tell me about the new project that is about to come out. It's called The Tender Bar, and we shot it in Boston. It's a memoir of a writer, a journalist writer, and takes place in the 70s and 80s in Long Island, Yale, it's a coming of age story. Starts with the strong desire of a little kid to become an author, and fascination is fascination by books and his longing for his father, who is basically failing him, and and he keeps looking for a substitute, which basically is his uncle Charlie. His uncle Charlie, played by uh, Ben Affleck. It's a drama, and I would say just based on the last couple uh, directorial efforts from George Clooney, it feels like a departure. It doesn't feel like maybe what you might expect from a a George Clooney film. Can you talk about maybe your early conversations about what this movie was going to look like and what sort of feeling uh, you wanted to have come across? Josh wanted to do a warm movie because he felt that what we need in this time is a little bit of uh, love and caring, and he was fascinated by the story of and and the world of um, the bar the little boy grows up in. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the bar of Uncle Charlie, but there's a lot of books. And then Uncle Charlie introduces him to the books and to the stories. And he's so fascinated by it that he really dives in and, and gets lost in it. And Uncle Charlie becomes almost like a father figure. So we talked about 70s films. We talked about using 70s film language, like, uh, you know, like zooming in pictures when you see a reaction of somebody. There's a snap zoom sometimes. And then it's underlining a little bit of the comedy. It's a drama, but it's actually, there's it a lot of 
moments too where you can laugh and and where it's really everything is pretty warm hearted. It's almost like a sweet memory. Yeah, you've got uh, multi generations and extended family all living under uh, the grandfather's roof, uh, played by Christopher Lloyd, who is a wonderful actor, but he's just got such great comedy chops. He plays the, the curmudgeon so well. Can you talk a little bit about how so much of the movie kind of takes place in this this house, in this house where they're all kind of under one mm. roof and the bar? Mm. There's there's a few locations uh, for this, including Yale. But did you kind of approach each of these locations and time periods a little bit differently, trying to change the look, or is is it all, for, for you, would you say, very much grounded in the same period of time? Did you divide up your style between each of these sections? Not so much on this, because I don't know. If, if I remember my grandparents' place, that never changed. And what we wanted to get across is the sense of this has been there for a long time. And this has not changed much. So between the 10 years or 15 years, between the two pieces, we didn't make it too different. If you look carefully, there's a new TV set in the house, but everything is not even from the 70s or 80s. It's much older. It has been there. It had seen much better days and then it's all pretty much lived in. And then the fascination is that the boy and his mom, they move back into his grandparents' house and his mom regards it as a failure. But for him, he loves it. He loves it there because it's people, it's stories, and he's not on his own. And there's a warmth to it, which he considers his home. So that's one something which was important to us. The warmth of that place and, you know, the feeling it is, it, that doesn't change. Not when he's 10 years old or younger. It's true. There's a soft light. There's a soft quality. There's an inv a welcoming quality, uh, especially for Jr. in the grandfather's house. And he says uh, several times that that's where he really likes it. So can you talk a little bit about how that you went about creating the look and feel then of his happy place? Yeah, what we wanted is um, we wanted it to be real. And sometimes when you see period, especially now with all the TV shows, they stylize things so much. And then it's good, but I get tired of it very quickly because it's, it's either you fall for it and then it's great or it becomes such a stylization. And we wanted it to be more real and, it, and more. It's real, for sure. You know, yeah. it, it definitely has yeah. a, a real feel. So uh, yeah, and, as and someone that, who grew up and lived through that era, I, I, I can tell you for sure that, that, that it's, yeah. uh, it, it feels extremely real. The production design is, is spot on and stuff. And it, it, it actually, it took me back a little bit to that time period. So I think that you were very successful in, in, in your realism. Yeah. But at the same time, too, it also, it, everyone just seems to have a level of comfort there. Everyone feels very, you mm. know, casually and, and, and relaxed, even though it's a little dilapidated, a little run down. I was just curious if there was any tricks or something that you went to to try to create that that look and feel inside of there. Yeah, what we did as, um, in the beginning, Jennifer Egan, the costume designer, Kalina, production designer, and, and we were all pulling some references. We were showing, oh, this could be an idea, this could be an idea. And we all came back to... Each one of us had pictures of uh, William Eggleston, which we liked and, and which we anchored our stuff around a little bit. And then I tried to, I wish out a couple of tests and, you know, the Kodachrome quality, the warmth, and then the simplicity, but yet you have some texture in that. And I tried to get to that. We shot digital, but I added a little bit of ultra contrast because modern lenses are very often a bit too sharp and a bit too contrasty. We took that away. We added atmosphere where we could. We did a lot of testing on, although the house is a studio built, we put a lot of bounces outside the windows and we lit mostly through the windows and we had some soft boxes from the top, but, but we kept the lighting very simple. So you could move almost 360 and then shoot in a quick consecutive style rather than, oh, you do one shot, it's extremely beautiful, and then two hours to do the next shot. We didn't want that. A, because we had a nine-year-old boy who hadn't acted before. B, we felt it was the wrong style for this film. We wanted the comfort. We wanted everybody to get used to each other. We wanted to sometimes to just be there. When the whole family is at the table, we just point cameras sometimes and we pick moments. And other times we would be we wanted some intimacy when the boy is in in the bedroom with his mom and they share a bedroom and they talk. We wanted that to be intimate and, and close. And so those were the tricks. We used a lot of zooms, small compact zooms. We kept a small compact camera package so we could move in small room quickly, basically. Gotcha. 
And then moving to the bar, was it much of the same sort of thought process? Or, I mean, because he spends a lot of time, the other big location set mm-hmm. pieces, the bar. How did you approach, you know, this different space for JR as he's growing up through his life? A little bit similar because, uh, you know, those bars are the same as well because people go there forever. You know, the bar flies, we call it the bar flies, the friends who are always there, they always have the same spots. And then, then very often we had an idea of how the scene would play out. And then we used the whole room. You know, we had them walking from one place to the other. We never tried to do the same setup twice, but um, there's a lot of scenes in there and then it's a limited space. So I tried to keep it lighting-wise interesting. Again, a lot of the lights came from the exterior. We had nights, we had days, we had a few changes between the periods. But again, it's not a major change. It's not like you're painting the walls when it's 10 years later. Because yeah. they wouldn't. Yeah, I'd say that it has a very natural quality through the whole thing. I think that you, you really succeeded. Yeah. In, in the early conversations, though, when you're kind of trying to come up with your color palette for 1970s, it's so easy to go over the top. I see it happen all the time. It's like, oh, it's the 70s. Immediately, yeah. everything is now brown. So <laughs> it seems yeah. to, uh, what, what kind of uh, discussions or testing or did you come up with for what you wanted the palette to be for the 1970s and early 80s? Now, I mean, we did... Um... Kalina had wallpapers, which she had manufactured herself. And, and so we printed some of those. We looked at them. We put them in the light. We said, oh, maybe this would be more tone like that. Um, should, this should be like this. I didn't want to see too much of the outside world. So we tested a lot of um, shears and whatever we could put on windows to get the light more diffuse coming in and to lose a bit of the exterior world. The same in the bar, we did try various window treatments and then that's how we got there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that it was all very effective. I think it all really yeah. Yeah, comes through. Thank you. Hey, I want to talk a little bit more about your collaboration with, with George. I mean, you guys have worked together, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, since The American. I mean, that, that was the first time that you guys uh, worked together. Tell me about this relationship now of, of going on and doing, uh, you know, Catch-22 and, and several things together. And, and uh, mm-hmm. tell me about that. So on The American, George was an actor and producer um, together with Grant Hasloff, his uh, business partner. And we were basically, I think they had seen Control, which I had shot with Anton Corwin, the director. And then they wanted to work with Anton and Anton brought me along. So mm. we did um, The American almost like 12 years ago in Italy and it was really nice. But then, uh, you know, I had done one more commercial with Grant directing George in it. And then I hadn't heard from them for years. So when my agent called me 2017, I think, to ask me if I was interested in Catch-22, I was like, yeah, I'm sure they're just fishing. But we talked and they pretty much offered it to me. And I was like, okay, cool. And then I didn't expect that we would be shooting now almost consecutive every year one project. But um, Catch-22 worked out well. And it was good fun. And it was also, what amazes me is, A, George is really busy as a director these days. Mm, yeah, yeah. And then B, he's been always doing very visual stuff. And he's been working with great DPs, so I feel honored and, and I feel happy to have that trust. But it's also amazing that we did, you know, Catch-22, Midnight Sky, and now this is all different. It's like you're traveling to different planets. It really is, yes. And <laughs> Three very different looks. Yeah, for sure. Three oh, different yeah, very yeah. styles. Yeah, different projects. Yeah. 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 No, no. But I love that. And then I love that he, no matter what it is, um, once once you in his in this world, in his family, there's a lot of trust and there's a lot of close connections. And um, I love that process. And, and I love that he's always visual, and but yet he's, it's just good fun as well. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting, too, because you work together on The Midnight Sky and George acts in the movie. And I know that he was also the director of The Midnight Sky, wasn't he? He did both. Yes. yes. So so when your lead actor is also the director and in that movie, I think he's in almost every single scene. I mean, there's almost like I mean, he's he's in a lot of that movie. Um, uh, Half of it. Uh, yeah. Half Everything of it. Everything on Earth. Yes. yes. Yeah. Half of it. You know, so he we directed he directed the part with the little girl. First in the Arctic Station, everything on Earth. And then we, uh, for the second half, we had all the actors coming in. So in, in my experience, whenever your director is also an actor, and particularly a, yeah. a lead actor, 
a lot of feedback, a lot of opinion comes from the cinematographer. I, I have a feeling yeah. that you and George must have had to have a, a very close relationship and be able to give him feedback on his performance because you miss a lot of that if you don't have someone else who's there to to judge your work. Mm. It's very difficult to be able to know that you're on tone and you're on a correct level with everything else when you were the director and the actor. Can you talk about having to fill in in a role to help uh, support the your director slash a lead actor's vision in a, in a movie like that? Well, one thing you try to do is you always try to make sure that you have a plan and that, that everything's clear. So you try to take weight off the lead actor's shoulders. And then with George, it's like, there's always Grant Hasselhoff on set. And Grant is, um, you know, they've known each other forever. So, so he's like the closest. And then, yeah, but um, I think you have to trust a lot. In mm. that world. I've done that a few times. I've done that with Hugh McGregor. I shot his film, uh, the one, the only one he directed, and I did that with Julie Depi as well. So everybody's handled this very different, but but um, usually you're giving feedback and you're making sure that they don't, that they're not too much concerned about whatever technical pieces you have to fulfill or, you know, whatever it is. You try to take stress away and create a space so they feel safe and then you have to give feedback honestly and then uh, make sure that, you know, if something changes, maybe it's better to do a shot here to add some to it, or maybe you don't need to do another shot because you've done it in, in that one shot, which might be the whole scene or what. Yeah, I'm glad you, you bring up some of your other work here. I want to kind of jump back now and, and talk about when did you first uh, realize, when did you get the bug? When did you first realize that being a cinematographer is a career, that this is something that you could do and that, that you wanted to do that? Was it from a very early age or what, what, what was your journey like? Well, I was, I grew up in a small town in West Germany. So my parents, nothing to do with them. You know, they were workers and then no support, no imagination for that. And then no, uh, for me, I, I just got hooked by going to cinema when I was a teenager. And then I tried to go as often as I can. I took jobs when I was 14, 15, just to have enough money to watch films. And then when I was a teenager, I then realized, oh, that could be a profession, but how do you get there? So, and then I thought uh, a director would be interesting because you know, when you don't know about film, you want to be a director or you want to be a actor, usually. So I went to um, London to start working as a runner for for camera rental house. And, and then on weekends I would, because I thought, oh, camera is a good place. You're close to everything. You can see everything you're on set. Maybe that's, that's a way to start. But when I, uh, on weekends at the camera house, they would say, you know, you can go to shoots or something. And then that's what I did then. And that's when I first understood was what a director of photography does. And then that's the first introduction for me. And then I knew, oh, that's me. That's me much more than being a director. And that that's because it's, it's, you know, you're in the center of it, but you're not, maybe not as exposed, you know, and then you help visualize and you help sell it, telling a story. And then it, I love that. I still love it. Yeah, it's a very different muscle, I would say, that to, to flex than uh, being a director. And you're the head of multiple departments. And I don't think a lot of people realize also, too, the, how much uh, management and coordination is involved. Uh, mm. you, you've done some some very big shows and actually one that is a personal favorite of mine uh, called Counterpart. Uh, shot, I believe, in Berlin for a good chunk of that. And I think you're, you're based in Berlin. Was it nice yes. to do nice to do a job and sleep in your own bed at night? So work, work locally. And I know you're doing all the, these other jobs these days. But uh, t tell me about your experience with Counterpart. It was amazing. I mean, I met one of the producers, Jordan Horowitz, while I was doing The Keeping Room in Romania. And Julia Hart had written the screenplay for that. And we got on really well. And then they invited me to talk about Counterpart. I had a very good conversation with uh, Morton Tildum, who I set the show up with, and Justin Marks, who was the showrunner and uh, head writer. And I loved the process of that. And then we shot, I think I was working eight months on that. Five months of that were in Los Angeles. We shot a lot of the interior, Berlin interiors in Los Angeles. Mm. And then we went for three months to Berlin. It was a new experience for me because it was a 10 hour show and I was creating the look and setting it up with Morton. And then we had three more directors and you have the intention 
we had two DPs. I, I, so I created the look and then chose all the lens and all of that. And then was working very closely with uh, Justin on all of that. And then when we set it up the show, I did a lot of work with Dan Bishop, the production designer. We talked about the sets. We were pre-lighting the sets. We were discussing that. I talked with Justin Marks and, and, and Morton about the lenses we would use and the visual language. For me, it was a new experience that we then had three different directors doing three episodes each. I had not done TV shows like that before and not at that scope and not as long and, and all of that. So, you know, that's this whole thing when you stage something and or you go to a location and then you have five different scenes from five different episodes. We tried to make possible that everybody shoots his own episodes. But that meant sometimes you would go in for an hour or two hours to shoot your sequence with that director. Then the crew stays there to do another sequence from another episode. And then it's a bit complicated because also at the same time you're shooting while the other crew preps. So if you break that up to shoot your episodes, it's going to go. The cross is something which threw me. I was not so crazy for that experience from that point of view. But I loved what we did and I loved the show and then I loved um, Justin Mark's writing uh, and all the whole writer's rules. But, but I think it was just a brilliant show. I loved the complexity. I loved all of that. It has a very grand feel. I know it, it was contained in many stages in Los Angeles, but I, I got to imagine you talk about the complexities. You've got your lead actor, J.K. Simmons, uh, playing at least two parts and including multiple scenes where he's talking to himself. And so having mm. to use doubles and everything else. And then you have multiple episodes and uh, different people coming in, in and out. Can you talk a little bit about keeping that straight, keeping straight all of the different complexities with just your, your sequence and your cast? I think... The brilliant writing helped a lot and then because it was always clear by writing in which world you are, but it, it's complex and you have to not confuse your people, uh, your viewers. So there was a lot of thought which went into that uh, process and a lot of, you know, the actors playing themselves means you have to double things and, and it's complicated sometimes. Uh, yeah, yeah and, and Alec, of course, uh, a very accomplished cinematographer in his own right. He's He's been on the show, yeah. friend of the show. Um, but I think Counterpart had uh, so much wonderful stuff working for it, and it had mm. tremendous appeal. I Everyone I talked to who tried the show, everybody loved it. And of course, I, I think it actually ends in, in a, a fairly decent spot, although though I recall, I think it was the COO of Stars, Jeffrey Hirsch, who talked about getting rid of Counterpart and not renewing it because it was too male. And I think that I think that's really interesting because they they're like, oh, we're going to try and, and change the direction of stars now to appeal to females. But never once thinking, does this show here actually appeal to females? Because let me tell you, I, I knew uh, many women who also really enjoyed that. And I think that just mm. people really enjoy good programming, regardless of maybe the preponderance of one gender or another in the cast. And there's a really strong fe- there's really strong female characters inside of this as well. So anyway, I think it's it's very interesting how that it sort of unceremoniously was was dropped like that. But uh, I think that the the show holds up really, really well today. And uh, I think it's it's got quite the cult following out there, too, of people who are who are real believers. Oh, so really? So I, think, I didn't so, know that. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't I, know I, that they dropped it for that reason. I didn't know that there, it has a, a following like that. I'm happy to hear that because we put all this effort in and um, we didn't have the feeling that stars did a lot with it for, because rarely have I done a project which has been reviewed so well, but like this, you know, maybe control. Yeah. Yeah, they, they really should have been pushing it at the Emmys. I knew a lot of people who uh, really wanted to see it get more more love than it did. And I, yeah, I felt like stars did nothing with it. It was like, I, I yeah, I, I, it, it's it's really uh, it's really unfortunate. So but it stands up as a terrific piece of work. And uh, I know that people go back and see it and enjoy it because the two seasons really uh, stand well together. It really stands mm-hmm. as like a complete story. And you don't feel like everything was left hanging out there the way so many others do. It's a it's a nice button. And I got to say that it could so easily have gone into a place where how do you keep that story going? It could have easily descended into yeah, I think so many other shows have a hard time keeping it fresh, but it's a wonderful two seasons that I'm going to encourage everyone who's listening to us right now. If you haven't seen Counterpart, it's available now via uh, Amazon. You can go back and watch this. You don't necessarily have to be subscribed to Stars, although I think there maybe it is a Stars through Amazon. Regardless, you should go see Counterpart. It's really, really fantastic, and it's totally uh, worthwhile and, and satisfying. 
Martin, I know that we are, uh, we're, we're running out of time here. Is there a place online? Do you do any sort of social media stuff? Do you do a, an Instagram or have your own website? Is there a place that people can follow you if they like? I have my own website, www.ruhe.net. That's my website. I'm bad in keeping it up to date. So there's no trailer of Midnight Sky. There's no trailer of Tender by it and, and no commercial work, which I've done over the last two years. But um, you're in good company. I hey. would say 90% of the people we have on the show actually uh, aren't, up, yeah. aren't up to date. But we're going to put a link to that in our show notes as well, too. So if you go yeah. to camnoir.com, dear listeners, you will find the link directly to Martin's website. So you can go check that out. And there you can see I did hundreds of music videos. I've done a lot of commercials. And I still love that because it's, it's keeping me on my toes. It gives me time to wait for the right film and... You know, I met Anton Corbin on music videos, free music videos, and you always meet interesting people. So I, I love the mixture of all of that. I also have an Instagram and then I'm keeping that not up to date either. <laughs> all right. Well, what's what's your Instagram? We'll, we'll add that in as well. It's Martin Ruhr ASC. And in case uh, you can talk about it, and I don't know if you can, can you talk about what you're, what you're working on next? What do you have going on? I uh, will do a film. Guess who's the director? <laughs> George. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great. That's wonderful. It's called, it's called The Boys in the Boat. We do that. Uh, we shoot in London next year. Martin, thank you so much for being on the show. It was really wonderful to, to chat with you. And uh, I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right. So that was Martin Rua. Thank you so much for coming on the show and, and telling us all about uh, The Tender Bar. And everybody, go check out the Tender Bar on Amazon Prime right now. Yeah. You can watch it right now if you have Amazon Prime. You, you totally should. And now, short ends. So, Ben, it is that time. That time again. Short ends. What is your obsession this week? Uh, my obsession, actually, is another podcast. What? Surprise, surprise. Uh, yeah. You and your podcasts. Well, this one, though, is another podcast that I think would appeal directly to our audience. It's called Protecting the Frame, and it is a podcast by and for camera department people. The main host is a guy named Spencer Hutchins, and I actually worked with Spencer when I did second unit on Chosen for Crackle. He was the second unit DP, and he's awesome. I really love Spencer. When I, when I first met him, they were like, here's your DP. And I looked at him and I'm like, oh, my God, they got somebody who literally like is still in college. He was so <laughs> young. He had just graduated maybe a year or two earlier. But the first unit DP, whose actual name is Tim Burton, that guy works all the time. Tim had kind of handpicked Spencer and really loved his work. And I have to agree, Spencer's just a, a phenomenal DP. And his day job is being a camera operator. And he works on a lot of big stuff. And so Protecting the Frame is like, it's a great podcast to listen to if you want to know what it's like to be on set, if you want to know what it's like to be in the department. He, he'll he have like really helpful, he'll have a helpful thing talking about how to nail a whip pan or how to shoot a oneer. And I had subscribed to him and for a long time it had kind of gone fallow he had, and, I, and I thought maybe he'd given up and then maybe... Two or three months ago in my podcasting app, the logo changed. And I'm like, well, you don't change the logo unless you're going to do something. And sure enough, this week uh, he started back up. And I, th I think for people who aspire specifically to be in the camera department, it's great. He's he's just a very he's young, you know, but but extraordinarily experienced. He really understands how to work on a set. And I think he has a real passion for bringing that information uh, to an audience. So uh, definitely go check out Protecting the Frame. Uh, Ilya, what is your short end this week? My short end this week is the return of uh, Panasonic to the mirrorless camera, hybrid camera, video camera, 4K space with a update to their GH line. It is the GH6. And supposedly one arrives uh, on my doorstep tomorrow to, to check out. I think that pre-orders are, are now starting to happen. And of course, if you are interested in supporting this podcast and Hot Red Cameras, uh, they are available for pre-order over at Hot Red Cameras. And it is even less 
expensive than they announced it was going to be when they first announced this camera several months ago. It was originally going to be about $2,500. It's now down to, I think, $2,200, like $2,197, something like that. Uh, And they pack in a ton of stuff, and it is still the four-thirds sensor, which is a smaller than Super 35 sensor, but it has a bunch of advanced features, including image stabilization and anamorphic modes and more anamorphic modes than any other camera out there. And two things that are actually really interesting, they're now offering ProRes recording inside the camera. Mm. So if you are a uh, editor or you cut your own stuff and you like working with ProRes, you have the ability to record ProRes in the camera. There's a couple of firmware updates that are going to unlock more stuff in the future, but at launch, at shipping, there's going to be a 300 frame per second full HD mode. So you don't usually see little cameras like this having 300 frames per second. That is pretty Uh, sweet. That is pretty sweet. And uh, it's going to have full size HDMI and a bunch of other stuff. There'll be full details over at hotredcameras.com. And if you are looking for a, like a sub $2,500 camera, there's not a lot of options out there uh, that are really full featured video uh, centric type of cameras that offer all the still functionality you might want as well. So GH6 is uh, is very exciting and it'll be very interesting for me to see what they have changed because uh, they've had so long to work on it now. Uh, they, they announced it initially, I think, more like eight months ago Then they gave more details about four months ago and now here it is finally the day the the day of uh, big release was today they have a bunch of information and tomorrow the pre-orders start which is cool well and you have serious history with this camera this camera sort of is uh not this model obviously but the gh line was kind of the first camera that you made a hot rod pl mount adapter for so to me, like when I hear GH, I, I get a warm feeling in my heart because it, it, it sort of plays into the uh, origin story of hot rod cameras entirely. It, it does a little bit, but, you know, it, it's an interesting time right now, too, because, you know, the GH line was also the, f- the first camera to do 4K, the first camera to have uh, of this style to do 4K. I mean, if you go back and look at the original Alexa Classic or other sort of like HD cameras at the time and then compare it to in 2014, the, the GH4, the GH4 had more apparent resolution, which is mind blowing. It wasn't in any way else a real competitor for the Alexa of course but they were the first people to bring in 4k the first people to do 10 bit and they basically on this iteration just sort of like ratcheted up all the sort of functions and features and the one thing they don't really have haven't really spent a ton of on in the past was autofocus because autofocus not something you really use in cinema but as all the other sort of competitors have gone with bigger sensors and more autofocus supposedly the the autofocus has been greatly improved too so I can't wait to, to play around with that it should be a lot of fun to see what they what they've done i know that this camera is a long time coming it's got a fan and other sorts of things in it and unlimited record times and in some ways a lot of other cameras that um that might seem to be far more functional or have some certain features they all are significantly more money like fifteen hundred dollars more money so the fact that they can do all this stuff in a small camera at such a small price point it's really amazing and if anyone's out there interested in it, I'm pretty sure we're going to do a launch event in the time of COVID. We're going to do a very uh, clever sort of thing where we have uh, a timed entry and small groups. And and I mean, by very small, like like two or three people sort of in an area at a time. And we'll have stations so people can kind of rotate and we'll use the theater. I'm really thinking we're going to do a thing to promote the uh, it'll happen in March. I'll put more details in it in the podcast if anyone listens and is in the L.A. area and would like to come see the camera in person. I think we're going to do some fun fun stuff we'll go out and shoot something and show something and it'll be great it'll be great sweet very cool man very cool well i think it's a a time to go ahead and wrap up but before we do where can people find you you can find me over at Hot Red Cameras, hotredcameras.com. I'm there most of the time. You want to talk about cameras or lenses or gear or anything like that, hit me up, or hit up my team and uh, we're we're happy to help. Ben, where can people find you? You can find me on Facebook at Needs a Werewolf. The group is called Needs a Werewolf. Please feel free to join and and pitch me uh, your your movie ideas with werewolves. Also, go to BenRockOnline.com and you can find all my socials. You can see my my current reel. Uh, you'll see some of Spencer Hutchins' work on my reel because it's 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 on there. Very actiony stuff that he and I did together. A lot of fun. And uh, yeah, so Ilya, who should we thank before we go? It, ben, I, I really hope that someone does pitch you a werewolf movie that gets made and becomes a werewolf movie because Lord knows you spend a lot of time in the needs of werewolf. And I, I really hope that like something you know major comes out of that. Well, it's not just you. Okay. 
Needs a Werewolf just kind of came out of a boilerplate complaint that I had about a lot of movies. I would see a movie. I'm trying to uh, the Sound of Music. I, I'll, I'll try something. Sound of Music. Not, you need some werewolves. Not, not gonna not gonna piss anyone off. Hopefully, <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, it's a perfectly fine movie. But imagine how much better it would have been if somebody was a werewolf. And uh, you know, like, and so I, and it was just something that I would always complain about. And my wife Alicia was like, "You should just start a Facebook group for that." And I initially started it like where people could just go in and pitch movies, like you know, Zach Braff's Garden State, and and then like add a werewolf into the plot line and see how it, you know, with those basic characters and that basic plot. But when you add a werewolf, suddenly it's uh, it's a whole different movie. And I, I, uh, I'm just imagining like those towhead white children singing "So Long, Farewell," and. Then out jumps the werewolf. Avita <laughs> yeah. saying, "Then, then p- the werewolf puts on a top hat and starts dancing with them." Of course, that's. <laughs> you see, see, you see how easy and fun it is. <laughs> There's, it, it's, it's really a lot of fun, and so uh, the group has grown, I think, to over 750 people now. So, uh, 750 so. people out there believe that. Act, actively participating in uh, in pitching. Where, I mean, it, it's grown to other stuff than just pitching movies with werewolves in it, but it, it's uh, it's definitely grown. And I mean, that's the phenomenology of uh, group dynamics, really. You know, you, you you create a group like that, and then all of a sudden, uh, it starts taking on a life of its own, and people start doing their own thing. You know, well, well I'm the, no one's ever accused you of having too much time on your hands, Ben. So uh, I am I'm impressed that you've been able to uh, you know moderate <laughs> this this group and nurture it to now nearly a moderate. thousand people. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of moderating going on. So. Uh, all right, Ben, let's thank some people. Let's thank, let's, first of all, let's thank Ben Katz. Cause oh, ben my God. Katz. We put you through the ringer this week, Ben, and I really apologize. Yeah, we, we, we really failed you. So uh, thank yeah, you we, for We for failed not. you as friends and colleagues to, uh, this week, Ben. So sorry. Uh, all right, let's thank Kay's Alatrachi. Kay's, uh, thank you for that music. Oh, which reminds me, uh, I think that maybe Kay's should compose some music for like, uh, specifically for like when we do like listener mail, wouldn't that be fun? You had a little jingle for listener mail, listener mail. That'd be cool. We could also have like uh, commercial music that plays under our ads when we're, when we're, Ooh, paying I like that idea. We, yeah, we got to yeah. get on that. I, and we know that Kays is listening, so we don't even have to call him for this. He's going to hear it and he's going to like be, yeah, right. I'll get right on that guys. Right I'll, after I I'll get right on pitch it. Yeah, no, no worries. He needs a werewolf. After, after I finish uh, a color grading, uh, the feature that I made in Houdini. And uh, la- lastly, but never least, we need to thank Alana Cody, uh, who has been kicking all the ass and getting so many amazing interviews. We have uh, we, we had a little meeting right before this. Uh, we have we have a whole really cool thing coming up. So uh, we and, and we have lots of cool interviews and, uh, you know, just can't wait to share it with you. All right. Well, then I think that's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.